There's a hotel in Athens that has 4,000 people on its waiting list for rooms. But it's not because it's luxurious or grand. OK, Olga, where, what's happening here? We have a drink. I don't know. There is a big problem with the plumping and the plumping thing. Some people stay for just a few days. Others live here for months. Your baby! Your baby! <laughs> You know, she can walk. We'll see ya. This one was born here. Yeah. Actually, in here or in the no, hospital. In the hospital. Come on. From here. A third of the guests are children, and they're everywhere, skipping, shouting, playing, climbing on the furniture, or into random laps, turning loose shelves into slides. By nine o'clock at night, it's pandemonium, a children's party gone mad. I'm Maria Margaronis. And for this week's assignment, I'm in Athens, visiting an experiment in living. A seven-storey squatted hotel where refugees from 16 different countries and the volunteers who support them live and work together. City Plaza was once an ordinary hotel, but it went bankrupt in 2010 as the Greek crisis hit. It stood locked and empty until April 2015, when Europe closed its borders and many thousands of migrants found themselves trapped in Greece. Actually, mainland Greece and the islands were transformed into prisons for migrants. The situation was like hundreds of people were uh, homeless. The camps were awful. This made the decision very easy for us. Olga Lafazani was one of the group of activists supporting refugees who broke in and squatted the building. Now City Plaza is home to some 350 migrants, including Afghans, Iranians, Somalis, Syrians and Iraqis, and 40 or 50 volunteers from across the world, or, in the term they prefer here, solidarians. We wanted to say that if we can run one of the best housing projects for refugees without any official resources, without state money, without any NGO help, without specialists, without workers here, then the fact that you are not doing it, it's a political choice. It's not that you cannot do it. It's that you don't want to do it. And this is the basic statement of City Plaza. Instead of tourist brochures, the rack by the reception desk holds leaflets about where to get legal and medical help. The posters on the walls advertise protests for refugee rights, not the nightclubs of Athens. The luggage store is packed with donated clothes. Newcomers get priority. And the blue-tiled water feature, now dry, overflows with children's pushchairs. No one here pays a penny, but everyone's supposed to help with the cleaning and the cooking in the hotel's industrial kitchen. Ahmed, a tall, fine-boned boy from Somalia, shows us around. Oh, we cook in some rice, yeah. also uh, and salata. It's a different kind of food. Yeah. Let me see the time. Maybe after 20 minutes, it'll be already after right. And then you, you can see it. Sounds but good. I'm new here, in City Plaza. You're new? Yeah, but well, I moved before three days ago in City Plaza. Oh, you just arrived? Yeah, I just arrived. And you're already working in the kitchen? Yeah. It's the chief of the kitchen. Who's the chief of the kitchen? The chief of the kitchen today. Quentin. Quentin. Are you Quentin? Hi, Quentin. You're the you're the chef today. What's this nice thing that smells so nice in here? Um, I had a touch of uh, creativity today. It's a uh, uh, leek gra- uh, gratin. Leek gratin. Sounds good. Um, so you have to plan the menus and the. No, we when we arrive in the kitchen, we see what we have and we cook. That's what I do at home. I see what's in the fridge and yeah. I cook it. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm not cooking for 400 people. The kitchen is fully equipped with huge fridges and ovens and stainless steel cooking pots. But the spices on the rack are not the ones you'd expect to find in a Greek hotel. There's turmeric, paprika, curry, saffron, and za'atar. And the walls are covered with photos of City Plaza residents, laughing and horsing around. You're French. Yeah. And yeah. how long have you been here? Uh, nearly five months. Like last year, I was volunteering in the camps, also. Where? In, in northern Greece, and I can see the difference, like the state of mind of the people. I see, we see less depression here. People have privacy here. The salad chopping line has almost finished its work and lunch is ready to serve. OK, guys, we will start the distribution. Finally. Just like in a real hotel, guests' room numbers are checked off as they come to get their meal. 
but here the portions are pre-dolloped onto colourful, mismatched plates. You can take two. When the dining room empties, we sit down to talk to Ahmed, the Somali boy we met working in the kitchen. I'm a 17, but soon I will be 18. You're just 17? Yeah. And you left by yourself a year and a half ago? Yeah. Ahmed comes from Mogadishu. His father had a good job driving a truck for the government until he got on the wrong side of the terrorist organisation Al-Shabaab, who wanted him to carry bombs for them. And he said, OK, if you cannot do that, really, we, we will kill you. But my father, he, was, he said, no, I can't, I can't do it. Al-Shabaab gave Ahmed's dad 15 days to think about it, but he didn't change his mind, so they killed him. In the morning, I think the first person who woke up is my mom. When she woke up, she opened the door and then she saw that thing really. What she saw was her husband's severed head lying on the doorstep. Really, she's like, now she's mental. We went to the hospital because my mama, she was in the hospital, I think, a few days. And now, until now, my mama, if she's speaking to you, like, she's not normal, like. Al Shabab came after the children next, expecting them to drive the truck. Ahmed, his brother and sister, fled in different directions. His brother's in a refugee camp in Ethiopia. His sister went to Libya. No one knows where she is now. Ahmed made it to Turkey and eventually to a refugee camp on the Greek island of Samos. I really, you know, the life of the camp is so difficult, really. It's full of people and everybody stay in the tent. In the winter, it's raining and it's freezing. The water is coming into your tent. All your stuff is wet. After many months waiting for papers and a transfer to Athens, Ahmed and some friends decided to make their own way, illegally, hidden in the back of a truck. On the mainland, he went for help to a government camp on the outskirts of the capital and to various NGOs. I went to many places, many organisations. And they couldn't help you? I, they couldn't help me. They what told did they say? Oh, they told me, Ahmed, just, they say you have to, you have to wait. You don't wait have to. where? On, on the park. In the park? In the park, really. Ahmed slept in the park for ten nights, being regularly kicked awake by drunken passers-by. He's just one of many people on the move who've fallen through the cracks of an overloaded system. People who give up waiting and leave the Grim Island camps before they've got their papers. Athens Deputy Mayor Lefteris Papayanakis explains. Uh, I have to say that we've managed to deal with the accommodation issue, I won't say 100%, but we are quite successful as a country. Of course we have people who are in a situation of homelessness. Unfortunately, because the process in the island takes a long time, of course people feel frustrated and they need to find another way. And for those who come in the back of a lorry or sneaking into a boat, there is no solution. So people out of the system uh, do not have the right to shelter. So for those people, would you agree that the squats are offering a needed service? I have said it publicly, and I have been accused for that, that squats cover a social need and a gap in the system, or otherwise people would be on the street. So Lefteris Papayanakis tries to work with the squats, but he has to walk a fine line. Even if there was the possibility to cooperate with squats, some of the squats do not want to cooperate with authorities. That's one side. And of course, the institutional actors cannot, how can I say, give backing to a squat. Because still squats in Greece are illegal. So it's, it's, it's a very difficult debate. But nevertheless, whenever there are issues around the neighbourhood, we try to intervene. For example, there are issues with the increase of garbage because there is a lot more users. We try to clean more than the usual uh, programme. So this is not intervening directly into the squat, but in the surrounding area. Back at City Plaza, Ahmed takes us to see his room on the third floor. Three on three. It's a good number, it's a lucky number. Yeah, it's a easy number. Yeah. Let's be very quiet so we don't wake them up. He shares the small space with two men who are still asleep in the middle of the day and whose stories are probably just as dark as his. They're absolutely out, fast asleep. Do you cook in here too? Yeah, sometimes. You cook in here? Yeah. Can you have your own bathroom? Yeah. Yeah, it's a little like a hotel. Oh, it is a hotel. Yeah, it's, it's nice. It's nice. Yeah, and, and... Many of City Plaza's residents spend the day in their rooms, sleeping, waiting, thinking about how to get to somewhere else in Europe or to Canada. But everyone here is supposed to work shifts. In theory, if you miss more than two, you can be asked to leave. Olga, City Plaza's mother hen, says that's never happened. However, it's not OK for people not to do our shift or to forget it. 
So we are using a very strong weapon, which is the dialogue. So we sit with them and we start explaining how important it is to take up the responsibilities. And after one hour of talking, they feel so exhausted that they promise <laughs> that the next time they will do their shift because otherwise we threaten them that we will talk to them again for two hours these times. So it's very convincing. A lot of the City Plaza children go to local schools by special arrangement with the teachers' unions. But there are extra classes in the hotel as well. We climb the stairs, the lifts permanently out of action, all the way to the seventh floor. Hello. <laughs> we, we were on number three. We finished number three. So if, you, if we're moving on to question four... Seven feisty teenage girls are learning English with a secondary school teacher from London. Their classroom is a former bedroom. The old curtain is still hanging halfway off its hooks. Ariane is the most confident and talkative of the girls. She speaks the best English and she's super smart. And uh, fourth question, what was your impression of Europe before you came? It means when I was in Afghanistan, I think that when I go to Europe, I can go to school and uh, I want to be a successful person. That's why I come in Europe to learn, to find a good knowledge for myself, to find a relaxed life. Safe life. Safe life. Ariane's 16. She's come from Kabul with her parents and two brothers. Today we want to go outside for a bike, riding bicycle. Can we come with you? Yes, yes. of course. Yeah. We step out of the smoky dimness of the hotel into the blue Athenian afternoon with seven teenage girls on bikes and their English teacher. Did you cycle around Kabul at home? Were you able no, to No, just go? once time I took my bicycle go to the nearest street, just one. Because the situation does not late for me that I should take a bicycle and go outside. Why not? The girl doesn't have this right to take a bicycle and go to streets. What would happen if you went out? Maybe some uh, people come and fight with us. They say that the girl should stay at home. Ariane, you're giving me a heart attack. Why? Because you go so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> what do you really like doing best? I want to write my all memories in one notebook. You want to write all your memories in one notebook? Yes, the memories that I come from, the illegal way from Turkish to Greece, I write these memories. The way it starts from 30 hours. 13 hours? Yeah, 13 hours. Were there lots of you or just your family? No, a lot. A lot. Yeah. Were you frightened? Yeah. During the night, they take some medicine for the children that they should be quiet. No shouting, no crying. All the walk was All at night? night. It was the hard things that I passed in my life. Back at the hotel, reception has had to deal with a difficult situation. Two homeless Iranians have arrived, a young man and a woman who says she's just suffered a miscarriage. But with a waiting list of 4,000, there's no room at the inn. Olga says deciding whom to take in and whom to turn away is one of the hardest things they have to do here. One thing you have to accept is that there is no way to make a fair decision. There is no way that you can know from the 10 minutes you see someone in the door who is more in need than other people. The woman, Hoda, is offered a temporary space on the floor of another woman's room, but Dariush, the man, has nowhere to sleep tonight. Uh, we try not to have vulnerability as the predominant criteria. There will be rooms for more vulnerable people, but at the same time there will be other people who can support them. From when we started, we knew that we won't be able to cover all the needs. Even if we house another 20 people, 20 families that are in need, there will be <laughs> two, 3,000 more that they will need a space, and we won't be able to cover it. Early the next morning, we go with Hoda to find Dariush, who spent the night in the park. He's waiting on the steps of the local church. How did you sleep? Yeah, no sleep. Yeah, you look a little tired. Darius explains that they left Iran because they converted to Christianity and leaving Islam is punishable by death. They were following me because of the underground church we were a part of. To make matters worse, Hoda's ex-husband, a secret service officer, was coming after them. 
they spent six days at sea and finally made it to a refugee camp on the island of Kos. We left Kos Island without completing our second asylum interview, although our first interview was very good. Hoda had illusions. She said she saw her ex-husband. It wasn't an illusion. I saw him. She says she saw her ex-husband on Kos because it's very close to Turkey and Izmir. And he even called me and told me that if he ever sees me, he'll have me killed within 24 hours. Because he's a member of Iran's secret service and he can do whatever he wants. Even now I'm afraid that he can come, even here. Hoda's face is frozen with fear and as we talk in the park, her eyes keep scanning the passers-by. We go with Darius and Hoda to a clinic run by the medical charity, Médecins Sans Frontières. He needs medicine for a heart condition and she is white as a sheet. The social worker at MSF explains that neither the government nor any NGO can offer Darius and Hoda a place to stay. Instead, she gives them a map showing several illegal squats where she says they can ask for a bed. We ask Apostolos Veizis, the director of MSF in Greece, whether his NGO really is reduced to sending refugees to squats. We find him in despair over the situation on the islands. Today I am in shock. Today I just talked to a colleague who came back from Syria and he was working before on the Greek islands. And he told me the situation in the camps inside of Syria is better than in camps in Greece. It's not surprising then that people leave those camps without waiting for their papers. But what are their options once they get to Athens? For people who are coming irregularly from the islands or people who are in limbo of their legal status, the only solution it is you find... Uh, a place under the bridge, or you play in the place under a tree, or you go to one of the squats. For people who don't have other solutions, we've been recommending people to go to the squats, yes. So we go with Hoda and Darius to look for a space in the squats MSF has suggested. Hey, is this the Jasmine squad? No, Jasmine is the squad. Oh, are you also a squad? Yes. Yes, we're looking for a bed, for a uh, place. We are really uh, You're full. full. How many people are you here? 25 more hours. Refugees mostly? Yes, Refugees. all from all refugees. All refugees. Yeah. It's like five minutes walk from City Plaza, and this is the other one across the road. It's incredible. I had no idea that there were all these squads here. They must be everywhere, and there must be lots that, you know, we just wouldn't hear of. It's this city inside the city. Across the road, we find the Jasmine Squat in a grand but peeling neoclassical school building. Hi. Thank you. Can we come in? Yes. Maria. Look at this. This old school entrance, all painted with children's art. And how many people are living here? Uh, we are about uh, uh, 150. About that. We can fill it about uh, 20, 20, 200, uh, 550. So do you have space? space yes. Room. We can, you yes, do? we can. Because we, we have a couple here. Uh, Darius and Oda. Where are they from? Iran. Iran. Yes, OK, no problem. Families in the street, no. The school is all hard floors and wide, echoey corridors bathed in bluish light. Hisham, the young man who seems to be running the place, takes us to see where the families sleep in the empty classrooms. Marhaba. This is one family from Iraq. They are new, just uh, probably for yesterday. Hello. Yesterday. Yesterday. Hello. They had, yes. Okay. So it's the old classroom, divided with blankets, hung on washing line. I can see the blackboard over the back there. For three families to stay in. Hisham is very proud of what they've accomplished here, but it's not quite City Plaza. There's running water, but no heating and no beds. Out in the playground, Hoda looks doubtful. Would you be OK to stay here? Yes, for sure it's better than the park. We've been told there are 12 large squats in Athens housing refugees. NGOs and the city authorities know that they meet a need and find ways to work with them in the grey zone of semi-legality. Even the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, sometimes unofficially points homeless migrants in the squat's direction. 
Giovanni Lepri is UNHCR's number two in Greece. When we say that we are not referring people to the squads, is that UNHCR, when we talk about referral, for us is a relatively official procedure. It's not that if somebody approaches on the street and says, I don't know where to go and I don't know where to spend the night, uh, some colleagues might uh, say, but there are irregular possibilities because there is no shelter managed by either the municipalities or NGO that is dedicated for this. So you might mention, for example, there's this place, City Plaza, where you could go and ask and they might have a bed for you. We might do it. It's something that, uh, that is... But it will not be part of our official role as UNHCR. So what's the Greek government's position on all this? In a grubby government office, the white-haired migration minister, Ioannis Muzalas, nervously fingers his cigarette packet as we talk. He seems to be in denial about what's going on in the city. The overwhelming majority of the migrant population, and we're talking about tens of thousands of people, are in legal shelters. Now, if there are a few dozen people, or perhaps a hundred or so, who prefer to choose an illegal path, that doesn't constitute a phenomenon. We have been to uh, NGO organisations which, which suggest to refugees and migrants that they go to stay in a squat. You've documented an illegal practice. The NGOs, you say, are doing something I illegal. I don't know. You said it. So in that case, why have the squats been allowed to remain open for so long? Why have they not been closed? The catalipses must not closed. The squads must be shut down. They are illegal and there is no need for them because there is space for all migrants. As to when they'll be shut down, that's the business of the police, not this ministry. Our experience is that there is no space for these people to go and I'm really wondering whether, in fact, these places are useful because they are offering shelter to people who would otherwise be on the street. What's your evidence that there are no places for people to stay? It's not true. We put Ahmed's case to the migration minister. He, he's been told he cannot stay in an official camp because he has not got his papers straight. Have you checked if he's telling the truth? You're explaining things that just aren't true. Tell us where he should go in that case to find a place in an official camp. official NGO to any official He's been camp. told that the NGOs cannot so help him. So he lies, or you? I don't think so, because the NGOs Why have told us the same thing. Why you don't think so? Do you ask UNHCR and yes, they told you that there is Yes, we did ask UNHCR. We did And they morning. told you that for this guy... Yes, they said it. there is no place so for these people. So it's not true, this. OK. So UNHCR is not telling the truth, the refugees are not telling the truth, no, Medicine there are Demont not the are refugees, not telling the truth. Look. This isn't going to work, guys. You're not being friendly. Stop recording. This interview never happened. At this point, we were thrown out of the minister's office. Two weeks after our interview, Mr Muzalas was replaced in a cabinet reshuffle and hospitalised for stress. To be fair, the minister's had a very difficult task. Two years after the EU-Turkey statement that was supposed to stop the flow of refugees and migrants to Greece, some 50,000 people are still stuck here, and more arrive every day. There are more than 2,000 unaccompanied children on the waiting list for suitable accommodation, and the relocation programme meant to move people on to other EU countries ended quietly last September. Greece has become a buffer zone for keeping refugees and migrants out of the rest of Europe. Meanwhile, at City Plaza, Olga's looking worried. She thinks she might smell burning. Fire is her worst nightmare. It's a building that it's obviously overloaded. And sometimes like people want to cook something small in the rooms and they use a gas and then, you know, it's full of carpets. And However, you understand also the need of people who live for six months in a hotel room to be able to cook something. This building was also built in a period under the military dictatorship, so it lacks some regulations. But today, the fact that it doesn't have a fire exit, that the only exit and entrance to the building is these stairs, and if there are 400 people who have to go out, it's like, you know, 
It doesn't bear thinking about. Obviously, you can't know what's coming down the pipe, but how do you see the future? For sure, it's a squatted space, so you never know when it can be evicted. It can be tomorrow. We always have in mind that tomorrow we could be out. For now, at least, City Plaza is a haven for the people who found both shelter and human comfort here. People who, who are preparing to leave, like to go to Germany, for example, that are waiting for three years in Greece. So supposedly it would be a very happy moment for them. They are crying because they are leaving City Plaza behind. So, in a way, to be able to transform an empty, unused hotel into a home, I think this is one of the biggest successes we had in Plaza. City Plaza is a utopian experiment that can only exist in the cracks of a broken system. Greece has many cracks. People get lost in them, but they also offer a space of possibility, sometimes even hope. Bye bye. Do I say bye bye? Bye. 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 That's all from this edition of Assignment and me, Maria Margaronis. The producer was Chloe Hajimatheou. To hear more stories, go to bbcworldservice.com/assignment.